welcome everybody this afternoon. Um, and thank you also for braving the traffic. The World Gas Conference, an event every three years, is happening here in Washington. And so the streets are clogged with people from the gas industry. Um, my name is David Victor, and I co-chair with Bruce Jones the Cross Brookings Initiative on Energy and Climate. This is an effort to bake into all of what Brookings does on geopolitics, on technology, on economic growth, all of what Brookings does, more attention to energy issues and climate issues. Uh, based on the logic that many energy policy decisions and frankly most climate policy decisions are constrained and driven to some degree by what countries are willing and able to do for other reasons. And so that's why we're organizing the Cross Brookings effort this way. Um, and it's really my pleasure to introduce Fatih Barol, who will be with us uh, for the next hour and a half. Uh, Fatih is the head of the International Energy Agency. Prior to that was the chief economist of the International Ener Energy Agency. Is the, is the face of the, all of the major products of the International Energy Agency, including its flagship effort, uh, the World uh, Energy Outlook. He was formerly at OPEC, um, trained uh, in engineering and in economics uh, in Turkey, where he was born, and in Vienna. Um, and you have his bio, I think, in the materials that were circulated um, in advance of this meeting. I, I just want to say that there's one very important omission, which is that Fatih is a lifelong honorary member of the Galatasaray uh, football club in Turkey, which is the most important and successful football club in, in Turkey. In the world, not in Turkey. So, uh, <laughs> the world. Um, I stand. More I stand. or less. <laughs> and I can say for the Americans, every four years we're allowed just to call it football. And so enjoy that while it lasts, because it won't last, uh, won't last forever. So um, I want to say just, just one thing before we get started, and then Fatih's going to make a few opening remarks about how he sees the big picture changing, um, and then we'll have a conversation for 45 minutes or so, and then I'll open it up for, for a broader set of uh, questions and discussions with the audience. And I guess what I want to say is that, frankly, the energy business used to be kind of a dull industry, because you'd wake up in the morning and you'd do the same thing you did the day before. You kind of knew where to look for resources, uh, if you're running an electric company, you kind of knew what to do. You built a slightly larger power plant, slightly longer power lines. You did the same thing over and over again. This world is now transforming on almost every single front. You know, the question of what, is the, what are the frontier supplies of oil, now we're looking at horizontal drilling and fracturing of shales in a way that was not conceivable a decade ago, or certainly 15 years ago. Um, we're looking at tremendous changes in costs. Uh, we're looking in the electric power sector at potentially complete transformation of the grid such that the incumbent companies might not exist in some cases, or maybe they become more powerful. Nobody's quite sure. And of course, amazing changes in technology. And so on the one hand, that has created an enormous set of opportunities. And on the other hand, it's created an amazing degree of risk. And this industry is nothing if not capital intensive. And so how those risks affect the future structure of the industry, where people invest, what that infrastructure looks like, those are the central questions. They are questions that can't really be addressed seriously without um, a look at the whole picture, a systematic, model-based framework, and it's hard to imagine anybody in a better position to do that than, than Fatih Barol. When people think gravitas in energy analysis, they think Fatih Barol, and so it's really a pleasure to have you with us this okay. afternoon. You want to make a few opening remarks as to how you see the big picture changing, and then I want to drill in and talk about a few aspects of it. Thank you very much, uh, David, and thank you very much for inviting me to Brookings. So this is very nice to come back after uh, a few years. So I would like to leave the time for uh, discussing with you and with the colleagues here Q and A. But perhaps I make one um, observation strategically, and uh, second two important data points, important developments in the recent times. I want to highlight this uh, too. So when we look at the future of uh, energy, we see four major upheavals that will shape our energy system in the next uh, two decades or so. What are these four upheavals, as we call? Number one, China. China is changing, I'm talking about in energy terms, so is the Chinese energy system and so is the implications in, uh, on the global markets. When we talk about China, we thought China, remember, 
lots of coal, oil, and so on. But recently, David, the Chinese Communist Party Congress, it is the most important instant in the Chinese system, decided that China will push the clean energy. And President Xi, in his final remarks, a very long manifesto in the opening, in the closing session of the uh, Chinese Communist Party Congress, they summarized this under the motto of making the skies of China blue again. And today, China is the number one in terms of wind, number one in terms of solar, number one in terms of electric cars, number one in terms of energy efficiency, number one in terms of natural gas uh, uh, demand growth, and many things. So China is changing, and we will see the implications of this on the markets, as we have seen for the oil markets, oil prices, for the coal, CO2 emissions, etc. This is number one. China is changing and moving to the clean energy direction, cleaner energy direction. Number two. Renewable energies, especially solar and wind, are getting cheaper. And uh, cheaper and cheaper, and they are becoming the cheapest source of electricity generation in many emerging countries as well, in terms of generation cost. And we see a boom of uh, solar followed by wind. There are challenges coming from this in terms of integrating them in the system, but the cost is coming down. So compared to last time when I came to uh, uh, Brookings, uh, perhaps six, seven years ago, when I compare at that time renewables are now, renewables are not anymore a romantic story. It's, it's a business now, mainstream business. Uh, when I say renewables, it is solar and wind. So this is the second transformation in my view dimension of the uh, next uh, decades to come. Number three, United States. Almost uh, seven years ago, uh, seven years ago, in our World Energy Outlook, uh, we wrote uh, something in the, in the executive summary seven or eight years ago, Doug Engel would remember, he was our, uh, in our, at our board. We said a silent revolution is taking place in North America, talking about the Shea Revolution. And it was very silent. At that time, I even uh, made a joke. Nobody laughed. It was, I said, normally, revolutions happen in South America, but this time happening in North America. <laughs> uh, we laughed this time. Uh, this time, thank you very much. Very kind of you. So, uh, and that silent revolution we have foreseen, shale became very loud now. And our numbers show that U.S. will be the undisputed leader of oil and gas production growth many years to come. Tomorrow, we are releasing our five-year gas market outlook forecast, and the numbers are very, very impressive, I can tell you that. So this is the U.S. This is the U.S. is coming, and the implications of this will be felt from the trade flows to geopolitics of uh, energy, from geopolitics of uh, energy, to the implications for the other exporters and also many importers, gas and oil importers, who even will not ever import one BCM of American gas will benefit from this. If you wish, I can explain that. So this is the third dimension, U.S. oil and gas, and U.S. becoming the undisputed leader of oil and gas production growth for many years to come. Fourth and the last dimension is electrification. Our energy system is being electrified. What do I mean with this? When we look at the numbers, which we do, uh, you know, we make our hands uh, dirty with uh, data, energy demand is growing, but electricity demand is growing two times faster than the energy demand. So we are seeing that the, our 
in, in the buildings, in the households, in the industry sector, slowly but surely in the transportation sector, share of electricity also uh, aggravated by the digitalization of our social lives, electricity demand is growing very, very strongly. And this has major implications. And this is coming mainly from emerging countries. In the United States, or let me put it, not, I don't want to talk about the United States much, but let's talk about Europe. In Europe, we discuss a lot, in Brussels especially, should the share of the renewables be 37%, 33%, and so a couple of percentage points of the current European electricity generation. But India, in the next 20 years, is adding to its capacity one entire Europe. India is adding one Europe equivalent. So it is so important what will be done there. In the US, you are discussing the coal and gas and renewables. China is adding one United States in the next 20 years. The choice, technology choice of China, India will be extremely important. So electrification is coming from there, and what kind of decisions will, that will be made in those countries will lock in our technological system. Because as we all know, when you build a power plant, it has a lifetime of 40, 50 years. So the choice and the technology will be very important there. So this electrification of our energy and economy is very important. To sum up, uh, we see two, four major upheavals, China is changing, going into the direction of cleaner energy systems. Second, uh, we see that the renewables, solar and wind, especially becoming cheaper and can be competitive in many cases vis-a-vis -vis traditional energy sources. Third, United States set to become the undisputed leader of oil and gas minerals to come. And fourth is the, uh, the as I mentioned, electrification of our energy system. So these are the four strategic dimensions for the next uh, 20 years to come. Now, before uh, going to the Q&A, I want to mention two a bit re a very recent data points, which I think important to underline. One is on the climate change front. Carbon dioxide emissions are the most important uh, greenhouse gas when you look at the energy sector and which we do, in the, we look at every year very closely uh, the CO2 emissions. And we were very happy the years 14, 15, and 16 because global CO2 emissions did not increase. They were flat, 14, 15, 16. When you look at the history, emissions always increase if there is no financial crisis. In the recent past, it decreased only in the year 2009, when we had the financial crisis. Except for that, every year it increased, but 14, 15, 16, it was flat. We were very happy that we said at least it is, it is not enough to reach the targets, but at least there is a the, the, the saturation flat. But we had the 2017 numbers, and we were very disappointed because once again, once again, global emissions increased. 14, 15, 16 flat, despite a very strong economic growth worldwide, economy grew, but the emissions were flat, but 17, again, an increase. And I can tell you something, I don't know if it's a good news or bad news. The largest, some countries increased, some countries decreased in the world. Largest decline of CO2 emissions in the world came from the United States just for the records. We just look at the numbers. This is something that I think we need to see. Uh, and it is something uh, important to underline and look at the behind the uh, rhetorics, behind the discussions. Last data point, something about a, a subject which some of you know I follow since several years, electricity access in uh, developing countries. So when we have started, we look at every year in the, at the IE, how many people in the world have no access to electricity and where are they, these people? 
if you take your problem seriously, <coughs> you first measure it. We measure every year what is the development, is the progress or not. Since we have started to uh, measure this data, when we started first, there were three major areas where we have seen the problematic countries, areas. China, India, and Sub-Saharan Africa. Starting from uh, 1990s, China, around uh, year uh, 2000, fixed that problem. China completely went frontal and had a universal access. And now, as of April 2018, India fixed this problem. In India, now, all the villages have access to electricity. It's a big thing. In my view, it's a very big thing. India brought electricity to almost half a billion people in a very short period of time. Big part of the success, the credit, was the Prime Minister Modi and his government. They took it very seriously and go. And now the problem is left, which has started China, Indian, Africa problem. It is now left only Sub-Saharan Africa, where we have still substantial amount of people. Two out of three people have no access to electricity. So this is a data point. I was very happy to, because we work very closely with the Indian government, with the new idea, I should say, uh, that uh, uh, India have now universal access. All the villages in India have universal uh, access to uh, electricity. So these are two data points on the CO2 emissions and also on the side of the access to electricity I wanted to mention. Excellent. Thank, Thank you yeah. very much. So this is an enormously helpful overview. Let's take a few minutes and talk about each of these upheavals yes. in the data points. Let me start with the, the older industry, the oil industry. Yeah. Um, 2014 oil prices came down very quickly. People started talking about lower for longer. Then people started talking about lower forever. Uh, I live in San Diego and I get to commute between Washington and San Diego, which means I get to fly over the Permian Basin in West Texas on a regular basis. And I open the window, look down. It's just every time you go over, something's different. Um, it's an extraordinary change that's happened in the United States. Has this transformed where prices come in the global market and so therefore we're basically lower forever? I wouldn't say lower forever, as we see it is now over. Well, uh, forever is a long time. Forever is a long time, exactly. And uh, we don't know if we, have, uh, if we need oil forever. We will need oil for uh, several year, years to come, but forever we don't know. Anyways. I think uh, that U.S. coming in the picture put a, set a ceiling to how high the prices uh, can go up. If there is a high price, it will induce more uh, U.S. oil. Now, we are seeing the second wave of U.S. shale coming to the market. Only uh, next uh, year, 2019, 75% of the growth in global oil will come from the United States, the uh, shale. And if the prices remain high, it will be, uh, or these levels, it may be even higher. But there is one problem we have in the US, namely the uh, capacity of the pipelines. Uh, there is a need to, uh, if US is serious, uh, to export more oil, and there is opportunity there, uh, we need to uh, make uh, more investment and we need to uh, open the way for new uh, pipeline infrastructure development there. But uh, US coming in the picture changed the entire dynamics of the oil uh, market. So therefore, I believe uh, there will be more volatility in the markets, but uh, I don't think that we can see uh, oil prices very high for a very long period of time. Help us understand what that means for the role of OPEC. So last week, um, the regular OPEC meeting, was a decision to increase output. That decision has basically been taken by one OPEC member, Saudi Arabia, working with one non-OPEC member, Russia. Um, but does, when you take a step back from this, looking at the large sweep of history, does the organization you used to work for at OPEC, do they become less relevant, irrelevant perhaps? How should we think about that? So uh, it is, of course, uh, 
difficult to talk about, uh, uh, to say it is relevant or not relevant. But what I can tell you, U.S. is a major producer, growing exporter, and still many uh, uh, deposits to uh, discover change the dynamics of the uh, energy markets. And as such, the, uh, the, the established role of the uh, traditional exporters uh, are different yeah. uh, now. It will not change. And to be very frank, uh, David, we are uh, working on a subject now at the IEA with several of the people from those countries. Given the shale oil coming big time, given the technologies, again, on the uh, oil consuming side, such as electric cars, renewables coming, it is the high time for the economies, producer economies, which are one-to-one -one linked to oil prices. It is now for them time to diversify their economies. Otherwise, they may well have some major difficulties, and it may be very late. Mm -hmm. Saudi Arabia now has a vision 2030, Emirates is doing something, but they should, and Russia as well, uh, you work on Russia a lot here in Brookings. So it is, if they are not able to change their uh, economic base, they may well uh, make strategic uh, mistakes there. When it comes to OPEC, the decision in OPEC uh, taken, we welcome any uh, increase in production whether or not it is uh, good enough or uh, too little, too much. It's a, uh, a matter of calculation. Uh, but one thing I am saying in the uh, oil markets, in general energy, that I don't like very much, geopolitics is back to energy. Look at Venezuela, look at Iran, look at Libya. So there are uh, several uh, difficult uh, issues in terms of markets and market uh, deficits, and therefore it is time to producers to increase the production. So let's talk about the geopolitics there. You mentioned some countries that are getting the message about reform. Yeah. Saudi, most interestingly, Russia for a long time, including on the public budget. Some other countries not doing so well, Venezuela. Uh, Venezuelan output is half, maybe lower, of what it was before Chavez took over. There's essentially no serious new investment. How should we think about when the wheels come off the bus in Venezuela and what that does to global oil markets? I think uh, my English is not very good, but I think wheels come off. I understand what you mean. I think wheels already came off. This is, and we are already. So it is, no wheels. <laughs> no wheels. I don't know if the, it is, uh, and we, it is very, very difficult. Uh, I mean, it is so dramatic that such a country, one of the richest uh, energy resources in the world, is in fact in a position to import uh, oil, oil products. This is a really a very tragic situation, and uh, and I hope that it will be restored. But the solution will not go through energy. It is beyond energy if you want to solve this problem. What about Mexico? Mexico has done a tremendous amount on the reform front. We just in Brookings have a paper out in the last 10 days, the first ever systematic public opinion poll of what a average Mexicans think about those reforms. But when you set aside what average Mexicans think, what we see in the presidential um, campaign and the likely winner is a populist who has said he will reopen the contracts, he will try to stop corruption, he will roll back um, elements of the reforms. Is that something, as somebody who looks at the oil markets, Mexico's a major producer, in trouble. Is that something that worries you, or do you think they're going to sort it out? So I think if, first of all, we work very closely with Mexico. Mexico uh, recently joined the International Energy Agency as, as a member. Mm -hmm. And it is the, in the shortest period of time, a country became a member. Because to be a member of the IEA is not uh, very easy to be. And there are many, many, many procedural things, tests, it's like becoming a member of the Galatasaray football club. Oh, this is something much more important. So this is, this is, this is, <laughs> it is, it is uh, Galatasaray is very important. So the, uh, by the way, Mexican team is doing very well. They even <laughs> won against Germans. So it is, uh, uh, now, uh, we follow, very, and I think I wouldn't call uh, Mexican energy reforms, because when I look at the depth and the breadth of it, it's a Mexican energy revolution, oil gas, renewables, 
energy efficiency, new technologies, it's huge. And I believe all these steps were in the right direction. But these are, as we know, in energy business. You get the returns, not immediately, but a couple of years later. Like in the, there are two areas in life where the investment has long lead time returns. One is the energy, the other one is education. You don't get it immediately. You have to invest and it comes back. Now, Mexican uh, oil production was uh, declining and as a result of the opening up, many uh, companies coming and putting uh, money and uh, uh, the capital there and technology, we, were, we are expecting Mexican uh, decline will uh, again bottom up and rebound in a couple of years of time. And this will be good for the Mexican people because it will be uh, income growth for them and they, the money go, uh, uh, in their pocket will be uh, much higher than in a declining term. So, in my view, it will be a great pity, a damage, very, very, very bad if, if those reforms are reversed and that capital, that technology uh, is uh, kicked out and we go back to the old times. We talked about the country a few minutes ago. One should be very careful what one is going to do. I don't know who will win the election, what this person or that person will going to do, but to turn your back to the getting capital, getting new technologies, opening up and increasing the production, if you turn your back to that and go back to the old times, then you may end up uh, similar uh, developments as the country we just talked about. So what, what do you do as an international organization when, imagine, after the election, Lopez Obrador wins, and it's not quite clear which forces inside the cabinet are going to triumph, but he said a lot of things on the campaign trail, and he said he's going to honor those. We have a president here who said a lot of things on the campaign trail and appears to be honoring them, for better or for worse. Um, what do you do as an, internal aid, as an international agency in that situation to help, Vene to help Mexico not be the next Venezuela? So, David, as uh, you know, you say things before you, uh, you uh, uh, take to office, and when you take to office, the life may be uh, different. For example, before I became the executive director, my uh, biggest aim was to buy an espresso machine for my office. <laughs> <laughs> and it took me more than one year to be able to buy that uh, express machine because the life is not so easy. There are many things that uh, hinder you uh, to do it. So uh, I believe, uh, the, and I hope, the common sense will prevail and the, uh, the existing contracts uh, will be honored. The right steps, uh, the good steps in the right direction will be kept. There may be revisions here and there, which I can understand, but I really hope or that the, the main direction will not change. And we will be advising the, uh, the new government of Mexico, whoever takes the office, uh, definitely in that direction. Because one thing we do uh, at the IEA, uh, this is uh, we, without fear and favor, we say what is, uh, what is right. And then afterwards, up to government to take it or not. We have the same thing with the German government, with the Dutch government, Japanese government, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and others. Yeah. Let me get one more question about oil, and then I want to move on and talk about uh, some other fuels. Um, one of your upheavals is the rise yeah. of America, uh, which is just extraordinary. In this town, that's sometimes called energy dominance. What Help us understand, there's no, there's no question that the revolution inside the United States has generated jobs, it's generated output. Um, does it generate a political benefit? I mean, what, what is, can you take energy dominance out for a drive and do something with it? Or what, what do you see geopolitically happening as a result of the, um, this upheaval in America? So I should, I mean, uh, dominance or not dominance, I should see the following. It's not your word, it's their word. Yeah. Uh, so I would say the following. I am an energy person and I like to talk about uh, only energy issues, but... But let's assume an international meeting, a summit, or a bilateral meeting with the U.S. and another country, whoever this country is. A U.S. Secretary of State is a, a major energy importer 10, 15 years ago. And a U.S. Secretary of State 
is a major energy exporter. I think the second one, Mr. Pompeo uh, today, would be sitting in his chair much more comfortably compared to his uh, predecessor. This is only uh, what uh, I can say. And to be very frank, uh, when we, if we talk about gas, leave the oil aside for a moment, the uh, US gas production growth is a good news for many people around the world, okay. including Europe, where, uh, where we live. Uh, I'll give you one number. I was thinking this for our press conference tomorrow, and I hope our press officer is not uh, here. But it's a very interesting number, <laughs> <laughs> because we found out this weekend, last weekend. Now, in Europe, one of the major issues is how we will diversify from Russian gas, as you know uh, very well. Why, first, there were many bitter experiences, as we know. And second, even if those experiences wouldn't be there, or even if it was not Russia, to be depending on one single country is not a, I mean, you want to diversify, not only the gas, but everything you want to diversify in your life to have a, a, the more, uh, to be on the safe side. And Europe took this as a decision, as a strategy to diversify from Russian gas, as we all know. But last year, 2017, again, the, our data shows that while the policy was in that direction, the diversification away from Russia, we have seen the highest Russian exports to Europe. 35% of total, total consumption. It's huge, 35%. And the decision is this, uh, that way, and the, uh, what is happening is just the opposite. So therefore, uh, I think US LNG, it can be the North African uh, uh, gas, it can be Norwegians, it can be, I don't know, other kind of Australia, whatever it is, or Canadian. So uh, there is a need for diversification of the uh, European energy uh, and gas imports, and U.S. is a very important uh, uh, option here. And I mentioned in the beginning, even if the Europeans don't import one molecule of American uh, gas, when they negotiate the price, with the Russians and or others, the very fact that if they don't agree on the price, they can have other option, will make their hands stronger in terms of price negotiations. So therefore, the US shale gas helps the Europeans or others. It may not be because you want so, the Americans want so, but as a result of the the availability of other options makes the hands of the Europeans stronger when they negotiate the, uh, the contracts. So let's talk about gas for a little bit. Um, the Churchill said about oil security that security comes from diversity and diversity alone. The picture that you've outlined about natural gas is the, is the gas is harder to transport long distances, yes. but now we see this incredible shift from pipeline long distance gas to now more and more LNG gas. I think the number of countries importing LNG is tripled, maybe more than tripled. It's just an extraordinary transformation. Has that, I, I sense from your comments that that diversity tells us that, the, that Western Europe should be less worried about its backbone dependence on Russian natural gas. This has been a question that many people in the United States have worried about for a long time because we worry about the reliability of, of strategic partners who are dependent upon Russia. Has that, have they turned the corner? I think uh, I mean, you summarized it uh, uh, very good, uh, David. Uh, I mean, if it was not even Russia, another country, uh, it would be risky to 35% of your gas comes from one single country, if it was not, if it's a tiny country. And Russia is not a tiny country, we know that. So therefore, it is even more uh, uh, risky. So therefore, in my uh, view, uh, it is now time the European and the uh, US policymakers uh, 
uh, should come together and discuss seriously how they can make the most out of this. Uh, I think it is the, I believe the, the, the guess can make the, this recently uh, the widening Atlantic a bit, uh, bring it uh, narrower in my view, and uh, it will, which will be good for US and good for uh, Europeans. Let me tell you, ask you about a particular project that's just, this week around the edges of the World Gas Con, uh, Conference, um, BP and its partners are celebrating the opening of the Southern Gas Corridor. This is a project that brings gas from Azerbaijan across ultimately Turkey and into Europe. Um, does this, you're Turkish originally, um, does this bring Turkey closer to Europe? I think this is a, first of all, this project is a uh, wonderful project because it will help to bring the Azeri gas to uh, Europe it's, uh, and helps to diversification that we were uh, talking about. And I believe uh, the, this project coming from Azerbaijan uh, to Turkey and uh, to uh, Europe uh, will be an important bridge, another important bridge between Turkey and Europe, which is uh, very much needed and good for the uh, Turkish and the regional uh, gas security. What, um, help us understand the outlook for gas globally. You think about the three major fossil fuels. Your projections show demand for oil rises. Um, your projections show that demand for coal a little bit rises, but frankly, the Chinese coal consumption is basically flat. The big growth now is in India, not in, in China. But your projections show a uh, global growth for demand under almost any scenario yes, rising to an extraordinary level. Even the scenarios that stop emission, stop global warming at two degrees um, see big growth in gas and then a leveling off. How, how should people in the industry think about whether the, that kind of bullish, bullish under any scenario vision of the future is right or what's, what's the biggest risk? We think gas has a bright future, but there are two major, major risks for gas, that it will not grow as much as uh, we uh, project. Number one, if the price of gas goes up significantly and gas loses its competitive edge vis-a-vis -vis coal and ever getting cheaper renewables, so this is the price of gas. If it is, stays at uh, affordable levels, there will be huge demand, especially in Asia. Second, very important uh, in my uh, view, environmental benefits of gas. And one of them is uh, in terms of uh, emissions. Methane emissions are very important. And when you look at the methane emissions today, the, uh, we are seeing significant amount of uh, methane is uh, leaked to atmosphere through uh, production, distribution, transportation of gas. If the gas industry cannot address this methane <coughs> issue, and this can be, we have shown in our uh, reports that this can be addressed with existing technologies and half of the emissions can be minimized or nullified at zero cost, half of them, methane emissions. And this is a huge thing, and I can tell, to put the context, this half of the emissions from methane that we can completely get rid of at no cost is equal to the emissions coming two thirds of the coal plants in Asia. Just let me repeat, because in the sentence may not be very clear. The, the methane emissions today is a major problem from coming from the uh, gas. And half of the methane emissions today can be mitigated at no cost. And this at no cost mitigated half of the emissions is equal to the emissions coming from the coal plants, two thirds of the coal plants in Asia. And this is a major homework for the gas industry. So they have to make sure that the prices don't go up too much. And the second, address the uh, methane issue. So those are two pretty big risks when you look at the global yeah. picture. And yeah. yet your own projections show demand rising consistently. So yeah. it sounds like you think the probability of those risks is low. 
Yes, the, we assume uh, that they take the decisions in the right way and the industry will address. Because there is one big advantage of uh, natural gas, and it is the reason why today in Asia it is going very strong, namely local pollution. We, have a, we talk about the, when we talk about environmental issues, the first thing come to, comes to mind is the climate change, but there is another one, local pollution. And uh, today, in many countries, uh, they used uh, gas in order to reduce the local pollution in the cities, SO2, NOx, and particulate uh, matters. It's a major issue. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a major issue. It's a big benefit uh, for uh, gas vis-a-vis -vis coal. Let's talk about climate change for a little bit. You mentioned in your opening remarks this inconvenient fact. You said it's a fact, yeah. not, not fake yeah. news, real yeah. news. It's an inconvenient fact that last year emissions are up 1.6% or so, depending on whose data you look at. The largest single increase comes from the United States. That's mainly because gas is almost free in the United States, and so it's out-competing coal, crushing coal, out-competing nuclear, which is not as good news on the carbon front. That has nothing to do really with climate policy. It's just reality. How do you think about whether the world is even remotely on track to stop warming, not at two degrees, but two and a half or three degrees? I mean, one can develop from energy models scenarios that get you to two degrees. They involve kind of some magic. You guys have scenarios. Everyone else has scenarios like this. But when you take a step back and you look at where people are really investing, I mean, is this just hopeless? One thing I should say before, it's a very good question before, and I will give a rather uh, blunt answer to that, but just tell, let me tell you, 2017 U.S. emissions coming down from gas, but also a lot of renewables in okay. the United States, coming, both solar and uh, wind. Now, to be honest with you, we look at the numbers. And, uh, we, many countries, many governments make statements and this and that, but when I look at the numbers, not only 17, 16 numbers, but we know, uh, David, looking, looking at the projects which are under construction, how many, how much of the emissions in the future are already committed. It will come because these projects are being, being done. In, in, I tell you something. In uh, Asia today, uh, 200 gigawatts of subcritical coal-fired power plant are under construction. And uh, this is 200 gigawatts. So, uh, now, looking at those numbers, looking at the political situation, looking at the priorities of the countries, and looking at the very fact that if we want to be on track with our scenarios, other scenarios, we have to see a peak of the emissions very soon. The idea was 2020s. And to have a peak of emissions, 2020, 2020s, uh, I don't it know, two happened. years, two, two years. Been in, uh, but in long lead time industry, 2020 yeah, yeah, is over. Yeah, it's finished. So therefore, I would be just, be, would be too diplomatic if I tell you that I don't know, I am really not very, very hopeful uh, now that we will be able to reach our targets unless there are major, huge technological breakthroughs. So this is, uh, I should say, because it is uh, unfortunate is the case. I mean, look at the data. I mean, look at what, what, is, what are we today, how much uh, the, 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 the carbon budget is left, and you look at the, uh, all the committed uh, under construction projects, their type and the emissions come from there. It is not even, you don't need a model. It's a more uh, subtraction, additional subtraction thing and you can get the number, so it is very easy. But I wouldn't be pretending being too diplomatic to say this and that. It is becoming less and less possible to reach the targets if there are no major, huge technological breakthroughs or huge political breakthroughs. Both of them doesn't seem to me right. very likely in the very short period of time. Let's talk briefly about both um, on the technological front. The first day of the Paris conference in 2015, there was a big announcement um, to the effect that many countries were going to double their spending on public sector energy-related research and development. That would increase the flow of new ideas. Bill Gates was up there saying he's going to do things as well, which he's done. 
How are we doing in terms of doubling, doubling the spend and making the investment in new technologies much more, um, much more effective? You, yeah. IA's own tracking yeah. suggests that you know in a few areas like solar, some stuff on data centers, a couple of yeah. other areas, yeah. we're on track, but but almost everywhere else yeah. we're still lagging. So that's not very optimistic. So we look at every year. Uh, we we trust the governments. Trust is good, but control is better, we believe. This is something said by it's somebody. trust, but verify. It's, yeah, trust, is, but control. Yes, control. <laughs> so we trust the governments, but we still control them. So we look at uh, what they said and what happens. So we look at, very recently, 38 key clean energy technologies, 38 of them. How many of them are in line with the targets that they should go? Uh, we have found only three. Solar electric cars, and uh, digital technologies, smart grids, only three of them. And other 35 either doing so-so or completely off track. But in terms of investment in clean energy, research and development, until 2017, four years, they were, it was almost flat. This is the government and also private sector, but 2017, we have seen a significant jump, 13%. Very good. And again, the, the biggest jump in terms of the clean energy technologies came from the United States, followed by uh, some uh, European uh, countries and China. Does this suggest, and I want to ask a political question about this, does this suggest that all of the noise in this town, in Washington, about not doing climate policy and back rolling back the previous administration's climate policy. Does all that, frankly, not matter? Because on the innovation front, the United States is still doing a tremendous amount. On gas replacing coal and lowering emissions, the United States is still doing a front a lot. A, a lot. Um, is all this just noise, or does it have a, a, an effect on the politics of the climate problem? So, it's a very good question. I cannot make such political sweeping arguments, but when I look at the numbers, I see that some of the numbers are uh, coming from US are good, but it is as a result of this or that, I don't know. But there is one political uh, move recently that I should uh, really uh, say, I welcome this very strongly. This is the 45Q for the CCUS, giving tax credits. This is a States. change in the US tax law that allows uh, people who build carbon capture and storage projects to get, depending on exactly how the project is designed, uh, credit that can be worth up to $45 a yes. ton for CO2. So, oh, thank you very much. So this is a... I'm always happy to interpret the American yes, tax code. Thank you very much, thank you very much. <laughs> and your English is perfect. So uh, the, uh, the, the thing I wanted to say is the following. For me, when I imagine if there are no technological big breakthroughs, one of the things I see is the, if CCUS can be helpful here because of the following, David. Why CCUS? Now, you know, the entire history of the climate change and all of this, the debates. And the, uh, in 1987, I don't know if anybody is in my age, I think I am the oldest in this. Uh, there was a, a Mrs. Brutland, the former Norwegian prime minister. And now the United Nations Secretary General in 1987 asked this former Norwegian prime minister, Madame Brutland, to make a report called Sustainable Development. This concept came for the first time. And her report was the first, the, the, the Bible at that time when it comes to environmental issues. And the, one of the most important recommendations was to reduce the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix. Okay, very clear, 1987. And at that time, the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix was 81%, 81%. And in the last 30 years, of course, there was a, I mentioned the cost of renewables came down. There were uh, lots of green movements, technologies improved. Many countries became much more, and the citizens became much more aware of the environmental challenges. And renewables are growing. This 81% in the year 2017, after 30 years, came to 81% still. No change. <laughs> This is the reality. So, therefore, when we look at the future, 
fossil fuels will be still, if you want to be realistic, part of the energy mix for different reasons. I can explain the hours and hours. And there is one technology which can bring this fact with the climate goals together, which is the CCUS. But current apartheid in 2017, when we look at all clean energy investments, CCUS investment share was 0.1%, nothing. So it is the reason I think this uh, new tax credits in the US may be a, a driver for it. And IEA works very hard on the CCUS together with the UK government. We are just before the two weeks before the COP meeting in Poland. We organize a high level meeting uh, with many CEOs, many ministers, with the UK minister to push the CCUS part of the uh, climate change debate in Poland in the COP uh, meeting. So uh, I believe uh, this is an extremely important story that the fossil fuels, we, we may see in the newspapers, this is growing, renewables, they are all growing, but fossil fuels still there, they are very stubborn. Economic facts are cheap, energy is very stubborn, and let's don't think that the world doesn't exist of Washington or Brussels or Tokyo, there's huge China, India, Africa, Asia, they are uh, the ones who are using more energy than uh, others. I want to ask you two more questions and we'll put it open to the, to the uh, larger audience discussion. Uh, on, on electrification, yeah. um, it's a very strong result in the energy modeling community that a world that decarbonizes is a world that electrifies. Yeah. The world's already electrifying, yeah. but the, the shift to electricity is even more accelerated because you can burn fossil fuels and plants with carbon capture and storage. It's easier to control emissions from a small number of plants run by adults than you know, millions and millions of sources dispersed throughout the economy. So I think we kind of understand why that is. Your own projections see a shift to electricity. Electricity is growing twice the rate of the underlying demand for primary energy. It's a super capital intensive business with a lot of risk, possibly more risk now than there has been in the past because of all these changes in technology. How optimistic are you that the capital is going to be mobilized to allow this pervasive electrification? Now, I will tell you something that is, again, perhaps I talk too much, I gave too many numbers, but this is, I cannot, I have to tell. So, in the year 2017, when we look at the investments, electricity investments, 95% of the electricity investments took place in the regulated environment, mm -hmm. only 5% in the more market environment. So uh, therefore, we are seeing the electricity companies are more and more need uh, security, long-term security for their uh, investments. If it is not there, it is very, very difficult. And as a result of that, we are seeing many changes in the electricity generation side, electricity technology side especially this 5% area. One of them is the, perhaps the only technology that we didn't talk up to now is uh, nuclear energy. Big thing is happening in nuclear energy. I was, I think, very recently I testified uh, in, in the Senate, I told them, for me it is incredible. If I was uh, an uh, American citizen, I would look at that number and I would uh, think twice. Namely, David, years and years, United States had the, uh, the largest, how do you say, the highest nuclear power capacity in the world, followed by France, uh, uh, where I live. But in both of these countries, A, there are no significant new builds. Two, many of them even though they could have lifetime extensions, they are not getting uh, lifetime extensions from the authorities or uh, they think market conditions are difficult. As a result of that, both of their capacity, if the policies don't change, go this way, and only six or seven years of time, China becomes the largest nuclear power in the world. This is for me, it's something incredible. So China, a country which started only 10 years or perhaps 15 years ago, serious on nuclear, overtakes United States and France, becomes the number one nuclear power of the world. 
And this has many implications. I can tell you one of them. A US, France, Japan were the countries who were exporting nuclear technology to other countries, their nuclear technologies and, and so on. And now, uh, when I, uh, and there is something learning by doing in the, you know, very well in the technology, bring the cost down. But there is opposite thing, opposite thing uh, how can I say it? For, if you, forgetting by not doing. So there are many things in life. If, if you don't do a lot, we forget how to do it. Like the bicycle and other things. Uh, now, in that respect, China, by learning by doing, bring the, bring the cost down. And the cost of uh, nuclear technology in the established, like US, Japan, and uh, European countries, stay high. And we may well see China, like we saw in the solar power, one day, to maybe Russia as well, being the nuclear technology exporting uh, country. So this is a big change in the nuclear uh, 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 domain with huge implications. And I would say just not just China, but also Korea. I mean, the yeah. Overnight costs of building a reactor in the United States now are maybe six or seven thousand dollars a kilowatt, and they're two thousand dollars, maybe less than that, in China or Korea. It's not surprising that Koreans are building those four reactors in Abu Dhabi. Last question: Your projections. You mentioned at the beginning um, this important issue of electrification, low-income communities. Over the next decade, we're going from having a billion people, roughly, who don't have access to electricity to 600 million or so who don't have access to electricity, essentially all in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, are we stuck at that point, or do you see the emergence of microgrids, um, private sector solutions, not grid extension, the way China did it or the way the United States did it, as the solutions to, to this persistent failure to electrify the rural populations in Africa, or are they stuck? So I am, I am hopeful uh, for two reasons. One, uh, from a democracy point of view, in Africa now, many leaders, they may be Democrat leaders or not Democrat leaders, understood that if they want to have the support of their people, they have to, one of the first, very first condition is now bring electricity to them. This is one, this is a, became a social driver. Number two, renewable energies are vast, very vast in the huge. In, in, in uh, Africa, we have 325 days in sub-Saharan Africa, very direct radiation of sun, even more than Germany. So if you can uh, look at this. Shocking, because so, <laughs> normally I think of Germany as a very sunny place. So yeah, something. 325 days. Hydropower, huge potential. And wind, offshore and onshore wind. Now, the good thing is this political and social driver and the cost of decline and cost of renewables come at the same time. 10 years ago, 10 years ago, renewables were expensive. There was a there was a uh, excuse, but now it is going cheaper, and I believe we will fix the problem of sub-Saharan Africa through renewables and also natural gas, Tanzania, Mozambique, Nigeria, and uh, and uh, others. So uh, we will see in Africa something for the first time that we have never seen in the history of energy. When you look at the U.S., for example, or Europe, or China. Throughout the economic development process, they use a lot of coal and then left coal, went to gas, renewables, and others. Look at US, look at Europe, look at uh, China. And India is the same. But in, in, in uh, Africa, we may have the universal access with leapfrogging directly it's going to renewables. Coal. Exactly, going to renewables and the, and the gas. Okay, we have time for some questions. Uh, we're, I think we're going to group three questions. And if you could stay focused on a question as opposed to a dissertation, that would be great. Right here. And please say who you are. Hi, Brian Scheid with S&P Global Platts. Uh, my question is about the OPEC deal. Do you think that's enough to stave off this potential supply shock we could be seeing in the next couple of years? Second question. Uh, right here, please. And the last one is going to be back there. Energy efficiency wasn't mentioned once. What do you see happening 
is driven by regulatory. You see the world going that direction? Mm -hmm. Last. Right there in the glasses? No, that's fine. Hi, uh, Blaine Johnson from the Center for American Progress. I was curious as to um, what your thoughts were about the maximum share of China's natural gas demand that the U.S. could expect to occupy, um, or whether China would just benefit from what you're describing of lower prices. And um, yeah, thank you. Okay. okay. So uh, short answers. The uh, we are going to have a, in the oil markets. We are going to have a significant deficit because of Venezuela free fall of production. Iran shipments is a, a, a major issue after the U.S. administration's decision. Libya, we have a, a serious problem in Libya. We are losing about half a million barrels per day there. So there is a huge deficit there. And uh, the recent decision taken by the producers in Vienna uh, is welcome. However, whether or not it is uh, sufficient enough uh, remains to be seen. We hope to see uh, the producers to increase the production even more, even more in order to uh, stabilize the uh, markets and address this huge looming problem in the oil uh, markets. Second question about energy efficiency. I am sorry that we didn't talk about energy efficiency because it is very important. We call it in, in the, uh, at the IEA, the oil, gas, renewables, we call the energy efficiency as the first fuel. But I can give you one uh, to tell you how important it is. Uh, one recent study we made, it's about air conditioners. Now, again, we always bring it to the developing countries because where the things come from. In the United States and in Japan today, Nine out of 10 buildings have an air conditioner. Nine out of 10. In Asia and in Africa, when you look at there, the only 8% of the households have an air conditioner. 8% versus 90%. And with the increasing income levels, we expect they will buy uh, air conditioners, uh, these people, and they should buy because uh, for comfort, you need it uh, at 50 degrees uh, centigrade. And the only additional electricity demand coming from air conditioners for cooling is equal in the next three decades, is equal to the current US plus EU plus Japanese power fleet. Just, just that. You know why? Once the, demand, one, the demand is very strong, and the second, big chunk of the boxes, air conditions are very, very inefficient there. If they were to have the efficiency standards, minimum efficiency portfolio standards, as they call it, like they have in Japan, for example, this demand quote will be easily halved. Efficiency is extremely, extremely important. And for, uh, especially for the, uh, when it comes to the electric sector, but not only that, also trucks and others, I can talk uh, ours. China and US, I think uh, there is a huge opportunity for both countries uh, there. Uh, Chinese growing gas demand, mainly driven by the, again, air pollution concerns making the skies of China blue again. And United States, I will give the numbers tomorrow to international press, X amount of growth of the world coming from United States in terms of LNG. And I could think there is a very good uh, uh, logical, I would say logical uh, marriage, uh, marriage de raison, so the, the uh, logical marriage. How do you say it, uh, Jet? No, oh, that's a logical, logical marriage. marriage is good. the good? Some some marriages are logical. You are right. So this is this is a. I didn't say a, that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's fake news. <laughs> what, you mean all of them are? Logical? No, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, just in thinking about the transport distances, most likely the American LNG is going to go into the Atlantic Basin. Yeah. And then what's going to happen is that cargoes from the Persian Gulf and yes. Australia that yes. might go to the Atlantic Basin yes. are going to end up in yes. China. And yes, so on. definitely. But I also believe that the uh, Australia is coming on board. There will be, a, we shouldn't forget the Australian growth. And in fact, what we think is, uh, David, in the next five, three, six, years, six years of time, there will be the champions league of the LNG exporters, all about 100 BCM, 
Qatar, US and Australia. This top three uh, will be there. And there will be, of course, competition between them as well in terms of the prices. And also, uh, as you rightly mentioned, many countries are building LNG uh, import uh, terminals. There were five beginning of the uh, year 2000s, and they are uh, uh, very closely, very sh uh, soon, they will be close to 50. So five to 50 countries have uh, this uh, LNG uh, terminals. Just in time for the Qatar yeah. uh, World Cup. Yeah. Um, before we go to the next set of questions, very quickly, um, there's a trade war underway. Steel is a part of it. The oil and gas industry uses steel like nobody's business. The latest list of retaliatory products from China includes U.S. oil and gas technology and a variety of other um, exports. Are you at the International Energy Agency worried about this trade war having a larger knock-on effect in the global oil and gas industry? I think the when we look at the history of economy of energy, there are always trade disputes between the countries. There is a looming one coming, we are saying it will not be the first and the last, not the last one. I, I can only hope that it will not have a major impact on the energy trade. This is, uh, and I would hope that the, it's a very uh, naive thinking, but uh, the energy remains as a business. It is not affected from geopolitics or the trade disputes and the others. But uh, we will see how it goes. But hopefully, it will not have a, a major effect on the, uh, the energy world. Next questions. Uh, right here. You've been very, exactly. Glasses there. And then we have. Good afternoon, Dr. Fateh. I'm Shruti Shukla, and I work with the Global Wind Energy Council. Um, I just have a question on um, what do you think is the implication of the drop in storage prices? especially in the lithium-ion batteries, and what do you think it's going to happen in 20, 25 years or so in terms of the energy mix? Thank you. Next question, Reid. Reid Dutchen with the United Nations Foundation. Uh, thank you both for your leadership on energy access issues over the years, Fatih, and also for this very good analysis. I wonder if you'd get into the speculation realm and uh, suggest how these trends might be affected by carbon pricing either regionally or globally and what the likelihood of that is in what time frame. Thank you. Last question right here. Doug Faulkner, Leather Stocking LLC. Uh, your agency has been a strong supporter of global growth of biofuels. You didn't talk about that much, but because uh, it was mostly about the utility sector. But um, could you uh, discuss that briefly, why you're such a strong supporter and what the implications are? So uh, let me start with, the, again, a brief uh, answers. Uh, storage, the, the storage uh, costs are falling down significantly. If, uh, if we want this uh, storage to be a part of our energy system, they still need to fall substantially. We are in the beginning now. And how it will go substantially down, we need government support. Without government support, if, we, if everything is left uh, to the uh, markets, we will not see a drop at the satisfactory level that they will be commercially competitive uh, in the energy uh, system. Thank you very much for also your leadership in terms of energy access, electricity access. When it comes to carbon pricing, I will give a, a very French answer. So what is the French answer? This is the... <laughs> Uh, yes, but at the same time, yes. So this is, I will give yes and no. Yes and no. Okay, yes and no. Yes, carbon pricing is, uh, uh, in, from an economic theory point of view, it is the best way to reduce the emissions. I completely agree. I think nobody can uh, uh, debate on that. However, there are two problems. This is no part. The, I, to see, to have a, internationally effective carbon price where the, where the biggest part of the emissions are coming from, to see it happening is, in my view, not very realistic where we are now. When I look at the, uh, I go all the countries, uh, China, India, Indonesia, uh, here, United States, uh, Europe, to see that it is happening in a carbon price that the without the carbon leakage to have an international carbon price, it is 
not realistic in my uh, view. Again, carbon pricing is the best in theory. Second one is, if we want to reach the, our targets, climate targets, we have to <coughs> see that the emissions need to peak sometime very soon, 2020. And we cannot wait. I mean, the carbon price accepted, discussed, how much $3, $10, $15 to be effective uh, currently. It can be in the future, maybe a part of the solution. But we need, uh, in my view, major breakthroughs if we were to reach uh, our targets. Major breakthroughs in terms of technology or in terms of uh, political uh, breakthroughs. Otherwise, it will not be, in my view, possible. Biofuels. So biofuels, we are a, a strong supporter. Yes, we are a strong supporter of sustainable use of uh, biofuels. In fact, uh, I would invite you to look at our uh, renewables report coming on 8th of October with a major analysis on biofuel strength, including its potential. Uh, and how does it compare with solar, wind, and the others which are very much talk, which are very much in the press? We think sustainable use of biofuels can be a very good part of the, uh, both the finding solutions to energy security, but at the same time our uh, environmental problems. Are you more optimistic about biofuels, basically the biofuel solution to sustainable transportation or electric vehicles. In, in the IEA projections, you suggest that we could have 125 million electric vehicles by 2030, up from two or three million today. That's a huge change. Yeah. That seems like that's the revolution and not biofuels. Um, is yeah. that right? So uh, electric cars is something very, very interesting topic. Last year was a record sales. One million cars sold last year, and we reached 3 million electric cars. It's a 1 million cars sold, and after there are now 3 million electric cars in the streets of the world. And half of them is in, in China, other half everybody has put together. It's a big record. We always read about electric cars, and your famous company here in the uh, uh, United States, starting with T. And this They're is, famous uh, for losing money. <laughs> they are very famous. I don't know. In Europe, we, reach, uh, we see every, uh, every day. It's very good. But we at the IE, as I said in the beginning, tried to put the things in a context. This uh, one million cars sold, it's a record, huge record. But it is still 0.8% total car sales. 99% were internal, um, not the traditional cars and only 1% less is electric cars. They are going to grow very strongly for two reasons. First, generous government subsidies in France. You have 6,000 euro subsidy if you want to buy an electric car. And second, the cost of batteries are, uh, are coming down. And this is going uh, very well. But, ladies and gentlemen, there is a discussion on the, is electric cars, does it mean that it is the end of oil? This is a discussion everywhere. And I think this is, uh, we think, in fact, I should say, we think it is not at all like this. At all like this. Not out of, uh, I asked my colleagues to calculate, not out of 100 cars was electric, but if as of tomorrow, every second car sold in the world was electric car. So one electric car, one uh, traditional car, instead of one out of 100, global oil demand growth will still continue to increase because oil demand growth is coming from trucks, petrochemical industry, jets, and shipping. Cars alone is not the only and not even the main driver of the, uh, the uh, oil demand growth. So therefore, electric cars will grow, but uh, it is too early to announce the obituary of uh, oil. We will stop writing that obituary right now. A last round of questions right here first, sir. Thanks. <clears throat> yes, yeah, so my name is Ted Conwell. I'm with Climate First. And you mentioned that uh, you weren't hopeful that we could stay under the Paris targets unless there are, quote unquote, huge te techno te 
technological breakthroughs. Other than carbon capture and storage, what other breakthroughs are you talking about? My name is Mark Grossman. I was wondering, sir, whether you might be able to uh, talk a little bit about the eastern Mediterranean, where it seems to me there's this combination of more gas being found, more politics, uh, and how you see it connected to the rest of the energy system in the world. And then last one right up here. Yes, thank you very much. My name is Mindy Reiser from Global Peace Services. We have all thought that solar might be the great white hope. And yes, I know we want uh, technological breakthroughs, but what do you see as really possible in terms of solar? Okay, so the first uh, question, except for CCUS, what other technological breakthroughs could change the game? Uh, I would say another one is the question that our colleagues, uh, colleague us uh, or mentioned uh, in the beginning, the storage. If we see this, the cost of storage falls down much faster than uh, the, uh, what we are seeing now, and if it becomes the part of the electricity system, this could be an excellent news in terms of the, uh, making the uh, renewable energies and others uh, part of the uh, equation. Renewable energies are growing, but it is their growth is alone not enough to bring us to a, a two degrees uh, or Paris uh, trajectory. When with the Paris targets, I don't mean the NDCs, but I mean uh, the, the what is uh, set in target by uh, many uh, uh, countries. East Met, uh, we have a huge uh, discoveries there, but discoveries made in a, if I may say, in the wrong time when there's a lot of uh, gas in the market to develop those uh, resources uh, is not very easy in a, a abundant shale coming to the uh, uh, markets. What I expect is Egypt, for example, the Zor field. It's a huge, very, very, very uh, good field, but this will be mainly used for uh, Egyptian uh, domestic uh, gas needs. Israel uh, will do the same. And I don't expect in the short term major export from Met East to the rest of the world. Maybe in the medium and longer term, but for this, uh, not only economic, but there are some serious uh, political uh, challenges uh, as well. Solar energy, uh, I think this is a, uh, <coughs> as I mentioned in the beginning, the cost is coming down substantially. Just let me give you one example. Between 2014 and 2017, in three years of time, cost of solar is halved. I don't know any other good that the cost is half divided by two. And we expect it will continue to uh, go uh, down. But uh, still, growth of solar is alone is not enough. And here, the Chinese policies will be extremely important. Because today, six out of 10 solar panels manufactured in the world are six uh, uh, out of 10 Chinese manufacturers, other four is the rest of the world uh, put uh, together. Huge potential for solar, but still, again, solar alone cannot solve the problem. Please let's remember the following. The, our energy problem is not only power sector. There is the industry sector, there is the transportation sector, there is the building sector. Electricity is one part of it, and currently we use solar mainly for uh, the uh, power generation and sometimes for water heating in uh, some uh, uh, countries. Maybe in the very future, we may make much more use of solar but I, I hope that very future is not uh, too late for the imperatives we have today, especially in the context of uh, environmental issues. No, the one implication of what you said earlier is that maybe, maybe too late is too dramatic, but, yeah. but it looks like the Paris targets are getting harder to reach. Just as we're wrapping up, I want to ask you one, one last question, Fatih. I sense in your remarks today some skepticism about whether the kind of normal market forces can address these challenges. Uh, you talked about carbon pricing, that in some sense it's going to be hard to figure out what the right prices are. Meanwhile, governments need to go out and get things done. You talked about storage. 
and the need for, in addition to all this market-led tremendous advancement in storage, at least some kinds of storage, there's a need for more government support in that. We were talking about investment in the power sector, and you made the point, very wise point, that the vast majority of the investment is in state-owned firms, regulated yeah. firms, in part because they're larger globally, but also because the risks are lower. So, I mean, as an economist, does this make you uneasy because it seems like the solutions here have to be more state-led than most economists would be comfortable with? Now, we have, in the energy sector, we have many uh, challenges, many uh, uh, problems, but some of the problems we have, especially those on the environmental front, are so, um, first of all, I should say, uh, make a, a disclaimer. You, we work a lot with the energy industry. You know, at the IEA, we have the, perhaps the, one of the most active uh, energy industry uh, group with all the oil companies, Exxon, Shells, BPs, the, the, uh, the utilities, uh, and so on. And you know, I have another head. I am the chair of the uh, energy board in Davos, World Economic Forum, where all the energy industries there. But some of the challenges we have today are so huge and so immediate challenges, imminent ch challenges, there is a, if we want to address those challenges, there is a need for a collective public answer uh, to them. We are not in a position to leave everything to the market to expect this, uh, to, uh, to expect this big answer uh, coming from there. It can be together with the private sector, together with the, with the uh, energy industry, but I see a, a, a leadership role uh, from the public institutions are uh, badly needed here. A very French answer. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Fatih Barol. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.